Please be seated. All right, we continue our journey through Epiphany, the Epiphanic season. I mean, we had Epiphany, uh, just as a test here, because you know I love to do this, because it, it all leads to this moment today. Uh, Epiphany, on the day of Epiphany, is the moment where we start to reveal who Jesus the Christ is, like that Jesus is the Christ. We had our wonderful Christmas day. We're like, oh, yeah, I got baby Jesus. Okay, great, great, great. Now Epiphany's like, okay, so what are you going to do about it, and who is Jesus to you? Is Jesus... Uh, the, the Christ. Do you believe that Jesus is just, is he just a prophet? Is he just a great teacher? Is he just your best friend? Or, as we learned from Epiphany, the three magi taught us three things about Jesus. And what are those three things? That he was king. king. Yes, king of kings, because they gave him gold. Second, he was Savior, because they gave him myrrh. Myrrh is used for, uh, for, for when someone's being embalmed, for death. So we know that he's going to die for the people. And third, they also gave him frankincense because he's going to be the great high priest. And that message, ladies and gentlemen, was given by three Gentiles. So we know right from the beginning, this celebration of who the Christ is, of all the good news of who he's going to be, is delivered by Gentiles. So right off the bat, we know this is a global thing. This, is, this, this, this messianic age that's starting is for everyone. Right? That second week after Epiphany, we get what big feast? What major event happens? The baptism, of course. Good news, great news, powerful news. Jesus steps into these baptismal waters to set the stage for us. And then who shows up? The Holy Spirit. And who speaks? God the Father, the Holy Trinity. We don't have many times in the scripture where we see the Holy Trinity all present at one time. This is good news, big celebration. But then we know what's going to happen is right after that baptism, where is Jesus going to go? Into the wilderness to be tempted. So the big, great, good news, celebrated news that we get from Jesus, now there comes the challenging news. Oh, but you got to follow me out into the wilderness. You got to follow me out there to be tempted. You got to follow me out to go after the wilderness where I'm going to go out into the streets. I'm going to go out and heal people, be with the poor. That comes the challenging news. Last week, we had another celebration. What was that? Yes, the wedding at Cana. We had over 180 gallons of water converted to wine because Jesus didn't want the celebration to end. He didn't want the bride and the groom to be embarrassed or the whole community to be embarrassed for this great community that celebrates uh, uh, groupism and, and, and everyone supporting one another and this etiquette of hospitality. It would have been just, it would have ruined the whole wedding but to keep the celebration alive. So the Gospel of John says the first miracle is going to be Jesus continuing the celebration, continuing this, this festival of, 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 of who Jesus the Christ is. But we know that Jesus, after that, goes out into the world to start dealing with the challenges of the world, too, and the difficulties that are around the corner. So we have, again, this good news followed by challenging news of what it means to be a Christian, what it means to not only proclaim who Jesus the Christ is, but then also to live. To what does it mean to live who Jesus the Christ is? This is the challenge, my brothers and sisters, of being a Christian. So today, that challenge, where almost the good news becomes bad news for some. We see Jesus being a very good Jew, even though that he was he would criticize the temple authorities, want change within the religion itself. He still was a good practicing Jew and showed up on the Sabbath day and went uh, to the synagogue, as it says in Scripture today in the Gospel of Luke. A good message for us that when we're challenged by our own denomination, we're challenged by our own church, we're challenged by the people sitting right next to us in our pews, we're challenged by the priests, you still show up. Because you ain't here for all that, you're here for God. You're here for one whole community. And sometimes it's going to be a challenge. Sometimes we're going to have fractures. Sometimes we're going to have issues. But we keep on showing up as a community. We just don't go and church shop somewhere else. But Jesus showing us, even with his challenges, with her, he still showed up. And he still came, as was his custom. And the custom of being a good Jew. So he shows up, right? And he starts reading from Isaiah. Because he gets invited up to, to be the teacher. There's three roles that would happen in a synagogue. The one who would be leading the prayer, the one who would be leading the worship, 
and then uh, the one who would be teaching. You want to be teaching. And the person who was teaching could be invited in. You didn't have to be an official authority within the synagogue, right? So Jesus gets invited up because he's, he's the big star coming out of Capernaum. You heard it. They were, eyes were fastened to him. They were excited about this guy, Jesus. Oh, we want to hear about this. All right. So Jesus comes into the synagogue. Oh, this is good news. This is great news. And he opens up. He gets the scroll because they didn't have Bibles back then. All right. Um, they just had a scroll and they open it up and he gets Isaiah 61. And, I, and, and Jesus starts talking and, and referring to Isaiah's prophecy of this mysterious messianic figure that just keeps on coming up throughout Hebrew scripture. And in this passage, it talks about the one that will come. That will be good news for the poor. That will free the captives. Give sight to the blind. And proclaim a time of jubilee. The time of jubilee where every 50 years, debts were forgiven. Sins were forgiven. That's good news for some. That's bad news for others. Because if someone owed you money, and now they don't. <laughs> All right? Good news can become bad news sometimes when you're trying to do the walk of a Christian. So Jesus starts talking to them, and he starts, and he sits down, and he sits, sits down at his chair, right? From, from over here, the bishop's chair, which many of the children call the mustache chair, because if you look at this chair, it's got a mustache on it, right? <laughs> so, if I say, so Jesus sits down and starts his teaching, because that's what a teacher would do. It, it, it's not like, like me, where I'm just, you know, jumping up all over the place, running up and down these aisles. <laughs> that, that traditionally, a good Episcopalian should probably be, you know, stationary, or, or, or sometimes you're sitting down and teaching. Um, like we have a professor's chair, you know, that, that's what, that, 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 where that reputation comes from. You sit down, and so the teacher would sit in the synagogue and begin their teaching. So he is, and he says basically, well not basically, he literally says this prophecy has been fulfilled today. So at this point, Jesus is either a complete psychotic <laughs> or a liar, or he is the Messiah. Because he's proclaiming it. This prophecy has been fulfilled. The, the messianic age has started right now. This is good news. Real good news. And it still says in scripture that they're excited. They're still into this. But then they start saying, but wait a minute. Isn't this Joseph's son? Wait, isn't this the kid who grew up down the street? Now a big old boy of 30? I mean, I know he was doing some stuff in Capernaum, but wait a minute. I need some more evidence here. I, I, need, I need some more. Can, can you do some more of those magic tricks that you were doing in Capernaum? And so he catches it. He can feel the crowd, you know, just kind of starting to doubt him, you know. It's like, it's like if I went back to my church in Los Angeles, you know, and, and got called to be there. They'd be like, isn't this, isn't this a guy who was just like an actor, you know? And now he wants to be, like, rector of this church? I don't know. You know, maybe I know he did some stuff somewhere else. You know, when you go back to your hometown, sometimes people are your biggest critic, right? I don't know about this guy. I don't know about this gal, you know? So he is there, and so they start, he can feel the doubt. He says, oh, okay, I bet you want me to, you're going to quote Proverbs. Physician, heal yourself, right? And that's what you want, huh? You want, the, you want the dog and pony show, don't you? Is that what you want here? And this is where Jesus starts to take the good news and starts to challenge them with the challenging news of what it means to follow the gospel. Because he challenges them by showing them that this messianic age is not just for us. We can't hold on and try to create our own personal messiah that's just for our tribe. Because he says, let me remind you about Elijah, the greatest prophet of all. And they all knew Elijah. And he says, don't forget about Elijah. Because Elijah, when there were widows everywhere, Elijah got sent by the spirit, not by Elijah's ego, by Elijah's spirit, it says in scripture, out to a different land, to Zarephath, to be with a widow over there who probably wasn't Jewish. And he performed miracles with her, including creating the food and also resurrecting her son. They're like, okay, where are you going with this? Mr. Jesus. And then he goes even a step further and says, and then don't forget Elisha, 
who took over for Elijah, there were many lepers in Israel at that time. But he got called by the Spirit to go heal Naaman the Syrian, who was an enemy of the Israeli people, who was trying to conquer them, who had leprosy. And Elisha healed him. That was it. That was it. People are waiting for a Messiah. People are waiting for this Messiah to come in and heal and take care of the Jewish people, to rise up, to vindicate them, to conquer the enemy. And now he's talking about our prophecies, our prophets, our biblical past is all about healing the enemy, about going out to the other, about not taking care of our own. Hold up, no way. And they chase him out of that synagogue. And they chase him out to the end of a hilltop. And they want to push him out over. And if you remember in Luke 4, right before this, in Luke 3, you have the, uh, the, the Satan tempting Jesus. And where is he tempting him? On the top of a mountaintop to jump off and see if your Lord will save you. Kind of ironic. Jesus being pulled in the same position from his own people, and from Satan. See, the good news became bad news for them. Because now we realize the good news, oh, it's not just for us? Oh, this is not just my good news? This is not just for my church? For my denomination? For my people? For my community? For my group that looks just like me and acts like me and talks like me? Oh, it's for everyone, including my enemies, including the stranger. And Jesus is not being a, uh, a big radical here. Jesus is saying, it's in Hebrew scripture. Yahweh's been talking about this the whole time. Grace and mercy for all of God's people. Even though you are the chosen people, Israel, I've been calling you to always serve the foreigner, the alien, and those who are lost. You, you bring them in because you once were lost. And now it's your call to serve and to have grace, even towards your enemy. That's the challenging part of being a Christian. The places, the discomfort, where Jesus takes you out of your baptismal waters into the chaos of our neighborhoods, into the struggles to preach good news to the poor. Well, if you're going to preach good news to the poor, you got to go to the poor. You got to go into the uncomfortable areas. You got to go into those places to preach good news to literally the poor or the poor in spirit. And guess what? We're all poor in spirit. We're all broken inside. And so we're all called to be into those, go to the discomfort of one another, of caring for one another, of loving for one another. You've all been hearing about our ministries over the last three weeks, so you know that we're doing that. We're involved with that at St. Mary's. But we have to remember today on this day that if we start acting on our faith just in what makes us feel comfortable, we are missing the mark. Jesus grows and enriches us when we go into the discomfort, when we go into the challenging places of our own hearts and minds and the challenging places of our own neighborhoods and the challenging places of this world and the challenging conversations that are happening and be the presence of Christ. And say, Lord, I can't do this on my own, but I'm calling you. Father Todd last week talked about family promise. What a challenge. What a challenge. We got the good news, right, that's being proclaimed. Preach the good news to the poor. Well, we got this opportunity with family promise. This great organization that's trying to put together 12 to 13 churches that are needed in order to take families and keep them together. Homeless families, keep them together and put them into church homes for a week at a time. And for that church home, to give them a warm meal, to give them a bed, to take care of them, and then allow for them to go off to this Family Promise Center where they'll learn life skills. And the kids go to school, and there could be tutoring, and then they come back to the church, and they could get a good night's rest. That's, that's challenging for a church to do. Ron King knows all about that. He's been preaching good word about it. The Anthonys know all about that. A lot of you know about this family promise. So in Martin County, we only got six churches signed up, and we're hoping that St. Mary's can be the seventh. That we agree 
that four times a year? Four times a year for one week, we're going to house three to four families in this luxury, this luxurious campus that we have. And we need a captain of someone who's going to raise up the volunteers to say, yes, I want to go. That's going to be on going to be a little uncomfortable. It's going to be challenging. I'm going to have to be out of my comfort zone. I'm going to have to ask a lot of people, raise up a lot of people to be a part of this. But the good news that comes out of that, you got the good news that turns the challenging news to the good news of knowing you're being part of an organization that has such a high success rate of getting families, homeless families off the street and on their feet. That's the gospel in action. Now, how glorious would it be for St. Mary's to be a part of that. This last week, we were at the uh, Martin Luther King celebration. And it was uh, the first time we marched in the parade. And I can't say how wonderful it was to just see the great turnout of St. Marians. We had 40 people marching in that parade. We've never marched in the parade before. And we were one of only three churches. This is healthy pride here. This is not, you know, bad pride. Healthy pride. Well, so congratulations. It's like, really? I mean, one of only three. There's tons of churches all over this place. It, we were one of only three churches marching in there and having a booth. And there was such good news of celebrating and, and, and giving out wristbands and backpack tags and making new friends and relationships. But then you get to the actual event, and then you have this booth. And when there's people selling ribs and giving away candy and doing face painting over there, the church booth is not the hottest show in town, <laughs> okay? I mean, we'll give you a nice, cute wristband, and we got some signs that say free prayer, but over there, they're, they're painting faces over there for free, Mommy. Can we go over there, right? So this is where our good news becomes challenging news. We got to get out there and start going to the people. So a lot of the people, like the 40 people who came to the parade, were there at the booth, and we started getting up our courage, and, and, and getting our wristbands, it's St. Mary's on it, and has a piece of scripture on the inside, and handing them out to people, and, and, and then getting the backpack tags to the kids. We had to leave our comfortability of our booth over here and go out into where everyone else was and start handing them out, making relationships, talking to people, maybe moving our free prayer sign a little more obviously here. And, see, and people started to come up and ask for prayer. And we had our prayer warriors there praying on people. All right, so going into the uncomfortable part. And then we see in the sea of people, there's these two teenagers walking around. They've been wandering around the whole time. And they would be what people would call like goth kids. If you're familiar with a goth, you know. And, and, and uh, I mean, I remember goth. And uh, I'm dating myself here. But, uh, you know, th th this, is, this is where, um, um, you know, they were dressed, I mean, there's different forms of it, but uh, you know, you, it, it's more of like kind of a reflection of almost like death imagery. So you're dressed in all black, right? The, um, there's going to be a lot of fa facial makeup of like, like uh, 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 around the eyes. She had uh, so these eye contacts that made her eyes sort of like glow. Um, black lipstick for both of them. There's a boy and a girl. Um, uh, and, and, and then making the eyes drip down with other black makeup through there. She had purple hair, uh, all type black clothing. And, and then she had these fangs in her canines, right? They're kind of like implanted in there, you know? And, and they, they, they just stuck out like a sore thumb. Like they stuck out like a sore thumb, right? And, and, and so, but they were there and, and like no one was talking to them. But they were there at this place and I'm like, I felt the spirit, you know, just kind of nudging me. I'm like, you, we got to go talk to them. But God, I don't feel secure enough to go do that. <laughs> you know, my insecurities start coming in. And my judgment starts coming in. Oh, they're probably irreligious. They're probably non-religious. They probably don't even care for the church. They probably hate the church because they're goth. They're not going to like us. And, 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 I, and I'm such a square. I have a collar on, and they're not going to want to talk to me. Maybe I should send someone else over there. Maybe I should take this responsibility you're giving me, God, to someone else. You go do this. And just finally, then, ah, no, you just, you just got to go lead by example. Just, just, just go do it. And so finally, you know, the Spirit just pushes you and go out, leaving the booth into the area of the whole area of Memorial Park and go up to these kids and be like, hi, how are you? And they're like, hey, 
what's up? I'm like, uh, hey, I'm from St. Mary's Episcopal Church and just saw you and want to talk to you and see how you're doing. They're like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm cool. And I got to learn their names. And, and one of their names was a fictitious name. It was Arlequin, Harlequin, which is like the, the female joker, right? Right. Um, noticed the fangs. They were interesting. And so I was like, okay. And we kept on talking. And then, and so we, we had a good conversation going, and then I finally was like, oh gosh, this is where the spirit really wants to really put you. And I was like, hey guys, do you want any prayer? And they looked at each other, and they looked back at me, and then their shoulders kind of just slumped. They're like, yeah, I think that'd be really nice to have some prayer. Great! Oh, okay, good, 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 good. I was like, Lalon, Nan, uh, come over here. And anyone else in the prayer team? Okay, come on over. And we brought them over to the booth, and we all held uh, uh, arm in arm around each other, and we started to pray for them. And, and they started to open up about what's going on in their hearts. And they, they had some, they had some heaviness going on in their hearts. They had some heaviness that they were dealing with about. You know, I can't really talk about it, obviously, because, you know, I'm a priest, and when people pray to me, I can't tell anyone else, but, you know, so, but, but anyway, there was some stuff going on there. They needed attention. They needed brothers and sisters in Christ to be there for them, and we shared a good prayer together and good conversation afterwards, and, and, and they felt the love of a community that says, I see you, and I'm going to come to you, and I want to invite you into this community we have here and just let you know that I love you. And, and that's where we start. And we made new friends and let them know that we're always here for you. you know, because no other community, no other place was calling them in. But, but St. Mary's did and prayed with them and, and loved on them. And so maybe we'll see them again. Maybe we won't. But it's just a small little example of what it means to just leave the comforts of the booth or of the church and go out into the community, and sometimes the Spirit is calling you to go do something that's going to feel really uncomfortable, that's not going to feel uh, like it, this is in your wheelhouse. But that's where Jesus is saying, come on, come on, I got something for you. I want you to go talk to that woman over there. She's a little lonely. I want you to go talk to her and see how she's doing, and maybe even ask her if she wants some prayer. Maybe she wants some prayer. I want you to make that phone call to that person you haven't talked to in a while and, and give them a call and just check in. And I know you guys have had some bad blood in the past, but maybe you could work through it and find some forgiveness or, 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 or healing with one another. Or maybe there's something on your heart that's going on in ministry that's happening in this community right now where you're just sick of just talking about it and looking at it and just reading about it, but now you want to go stand for something and you want to go fight for it, but you don't feel like you have the skills or the strength or the wisdom. Well, pooey on that because Jesus is calling you and saying, go out there and go do the work. Because this is the messianic age. This is part of the celebration. And this is the good news that sometimes it's going to feel like bad news, but when you go and do the work, it will blossom into beautiful good news. The good news of Jesus Christ. But you got to get your feet moving. You got to put your bootstraps on and we got to get to work. And I will tell you, a lot of times it's where it is uncomfortable. Where the discomfort, where the challenges, where we doubt ourselves. That's many times where Jesus is calling. Where is that place for you? Where is that place in your heart right now? Or be aware of that throughout this week, of the uncomfortableness of this world, the chaos of this world, and where Jesus is calling you. And we're going to have numerous opportunities as a church, as our outreach committee continues to grow. They had 30 people show up at the last meeting of ways and where we reach out with love. And I would say, jump in. Think about family promise. Think about how we're going to be doing Love Thy Neighbor, where we'll be adopting a house in East Jordan and painting and coming together as a community. Become a tutor, become a mentor. Oh, Christian, I don't know if I could be a mentor to a kid. Yes, you can. Pray on it. Because the Messianic Age has started, and it's very good news. And the, and the best part about it is that you're, you're not alone. You've got a whole community here 
and you have the gift of the Holy Spirit, as we heard from 1 Corinthians, that is working inside of you and blessing you and anointing you with so many gifts. At least one major gift for you to help change this world and turn it upside down in love. So let's get to work. Amen.